الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أما بعد حبت في الله كتاب النكاح The Book of Marriage Narrated Abdullah bin Mas'ud رضي الله تعالى عنه Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to us, O young men, those of you who can support a wife should marry, for it controls the gaze and preserves one from immorality, and whoever cannot marry should fast, for it is a means of reducing the sexual desire mutafakun alayhi, agreed upon. In the hadith of Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala an, in which he said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to us, so the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam addressed the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhu majma'in, and it was the youthful ones amongst the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum. He said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya ma'ashir al-shabab, من استطاع منكم الباءة فليتزوج. So the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam began by addressing the youth and said that whoever amongst them that is able to فليتزوج. This word فليتزوج the lam this is lam al amr in this word which is it means that it's in the imperative form that means it's a command. And whenever we have a command in the Sharia, in the text, for example, in the Quran, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa aqimu salat, establish the prayer. This is a command. And al amr yufid al wujub. That means whenever we have a command, that the origin of that command is that it's an obligation. So here the Prophet addressed the youth. Ma'ashir al-shabab. He said, O youth, men istata'a minkum al-ba'a faliyatazawaj. Whoever amongst you has the ability, the ba'a faliyatazawaj. And we're going to talk about, uh, break this hadith down in accordance with the explanation of Imam bin Uthaymin, rahimahullah ta'ala, who brings about immense fawa'id or benefits regarding this hadith. So the Prophet sallallahu as uh, Ben Othimin mentions that the Prophet wasalam, addressed the youth and he addressed uh, here in general of course the male youth because they usually have uh, when they are going through puberty and after the time of puberty in their youth they have the ragba, the desires and the shahwa their uh, de their desires and their their sexual desires and, and and have to fulfill their needs so this is uh, showing that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam address those people who are most in need of this ruling and that is to marry and the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said man istata'a minkum al ba'a Whoever amongst you has the ability. So the ulama, they mention al-ba'a al here. The, this word al-ba'a. That this has to do the... Uh, whoever has the ability to marry. And this could be either uh, al-istita'a al-badaniya wa istita'a maliya. So this can either be the ability... Uh, the physical ability or the ability through one's wealth. So there's two, this uh, term alba'a denotes either or both, as some of the ulama mentioned, it can either denote the uh, ability, the physical ability, meaning the sexual ability, and that the person has, the, has desires, or the uh, the financial ability because also we know of course 
in Islam that the male, his responsibility, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, al-rijal al-qawimun al-nisa, that men are the maintainers and protectors or supporters of the women. So with that role that men have that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them to protect and maintain the women, that means the men, they need to work. They need to work unless they're independently wealthy or however means halal that they have, they earn their livelihood or they have a livelihood that they spend it upon their family. They spend it upon the women. So this ba'a, according to some of the ulama, refers to the uh, istata'a maliyah, the uh, financial ability to marry. So the Prophet Sallallahu commanded that whoever has this ability, they should marry. And then he said, فَإِنَّهُ أَغْضُ لِلْبَصَرِ He says, for verily, it is, uh, meaning marriage, controls the gaze. So uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran commands us with what? Commands us to lower our gaze. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فِي كِتَابِهِ الْكَرِيمِ كل المؤمنين يغضوا من أبصارهم. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Nur, verse 30, He says, say. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, commanding the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to say this. Say to the, to the believing, to the believers, you know, to the believing men, but to the believers in general, lower their gaze. Lower their gaze. So this means it's what? It's a command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kullil mu'mineen yaghdu min absarihim. Say to the believers to lower their gaze. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is commanding the believers to lower their gaze. And in an authentic hadith of the Prophet, alayhi salatu was salam, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, uh, mentioned about the haq or the uh, the rights of the street. And part of those rights of the street, the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala, they were sitting on the street, basically hanging out, as we would say. And uh, the Prophet alayhi salatu salam advised them about the right of the road, and the, one of the rights of the road is that you lower your gaze, meaning you don't look at that which is forbidden for you to look at. So this, these are some of the evidences which show us that lowering our gaze is uh, mishroor. It is something, it's an obligation upon us as believers. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kullil mu'mineen, say this to the mu'mineen, say this to the believers. And then the Prophet alayhi salatu salam said, Men is ta'a minkum al ba'ata faliya tazawwaj. Fainu awdha lil basar wa asin lil faraj. So the second reason that uh, for marriage, as according, uh, according to this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, firstly to lower the, help to lower the gaze, to keep you to look at that which is permissible. Secondly, as the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, wa asin lil faraj. And that it is better for the private parts, meaning that it is, uh, this helps to preserve one from immorality because much of immorality comes from the private parts. It can either, of course, we use for the halal, okay, if you, you can either, your, your desires, you can uh, dispense of them in a halal fashion by legal and lawful sexual intercourse with your, if you're a man, with your wife, and if you're the wife, with your husband. Okay, that's clear. However, the one who does not do it lawful, lawfully, they incur sin. And the ways in which they can do it unlawfully is through masturbation, through uh, a zina and adultery, uh, and, and, and these kind of activities. So, uh, these types of relationships. So, that lets us know that by marriage, the institution of marriage helps you to lower your gaze and it helps you to uh, control 
your sexual desires, control your pr private parts, and protect them from immorality. Uh, and the one who is unable to do that, meaning unable to marry because they don't have the ability, as we mentioned in the beginning of the hadith, al -ba'a, whoever does not have this ability, either, as some of the ulama mentioned, bedaniya through their uh, the, the, this, the ability sexually, could be an old man, or what have you, or someone who has impotence, or whatever the case may be, some sort of sickness, or the uh, the other situation is they don't have the, the wealth to do so. They don't have the ability to be able to take care of a family. So then the Prophet ﷺ prescribed for them, مَنْ لَمْ يَسْتَطِعْ فَأَلَيْهِ بِسَوْمٍ So whoever doesn't have this ability, then they should fast. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, فَإِنَّهُ لَهُ وِجَاءٌ For it means a reducing uh, it could, because it's a means of reducing the sexual de desires. So letting us know that from amongst the ways to reduce one's sexual desires, of course, is fasting. The fasting, it makes you have a weakness uh, in your appetite, obviously. In your, I mean, you become hungry, you become thirsty, but after a time, your body becomes accustomed to that, and your body is weakened, generally, in a state of fasting from a lack of nutrients and a lack of uh, the sustenance. And that lessens the desires. And so for most people, that is a weakening of desires. However, some people have excessive desires. And this is why they fall into sin even when they fast. Even fasting, for some people, is not, uh, uh, does not help control their desires or enough does not control their desires enough. So, uh, some of the benefits of this hadith uh, one of the benefits is it shows the husn al khatab and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam haith the yuwajjuhu al khatab ila ma hamma awla bih so this hadith, one of the benefits we gain from this hadith is it shows us the excellent way in which the Prophet ﷺ addressed the needs of the listeners, of his companions, and address the needs of those people who were listening. And so who were the ones listening? Who did he address? Ya Ma'ashar al-Shabaab. He addressed the youth. Who have a need for what? They have a need to uh, fulfill their desires. So this hadith shows us that the Prophet ﷺ knew how to address the needs of those people he was and address the needs of those people who he was speaking to and who he was dealing with. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Another benefit of this hadith. Is أن الشباب القادر or أن الشاب قادر على زواج يجب عليه أن يتزوج. So the second benefit of this hadith is that the hukum, the ruling uh, that is derived from this hadith, is that uh, uh, a someone who is young, you mean meaning they've reached the age of pu uh, puberty or you know the age when they're when they're able to marry and they uh, have the ability to do so then they should marry Ben Uthimin says Yajibu alayhi an yatazawaj that it's an obligation upon him to, to, to marry and let's look at some of the details and then he says لِقَوْلِهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ فَلِيَتَزَوَجْ and as we mention uh, this uh, word فَلِيَتَزَوَجْ it's in the imperative form meaning it's a command that the Prophet ﷺ said, then they should marry, then he should marry, okay? And as we mentioned, the in the com command form, the asal of that is that it is an obligation. And then Ben Uthimin says most of the scholars, most of them, uh, say that the one who has the ability to marry, then it's an obligation upon him to do so. 
and this is be due to the great musalih, the great benefits that incur uh, by through marriage. For one, it protects your private parts, and it allows you to fulfill your needs and your desires and enjoy yourself. Uh, it also uh, helps to protect the society from the spread of of adultery, from the spread of uh, you know other things of people looking at each other and trying to date, masturbation, pornography, all of these things which spread due to the inability to marry. So that means that, so here, uh, the one who is able to should, because this is, has a lot of uh, a great benefits to it. Some of the scholars say that here, this command is for, uh, is istihbab, meaning that it is evidence that, uh, that it is recommended to marry, not an obligation. And they say that because uh, marriage is something, the affair of marriage or the issue of marriage returns or has to do with the benefit of the person who's going to get married. Meaning that you and I, when we're looking at the fact of, uh, of marriage, we know what's beneficial for us in accordance with our desires. So it returns back, this issue of marriage goes back to the benefit of the particular individual, not just a general hukum that you must do it, but rather that it is uh, recommended according to those scholars who hold this view. And they say that because it is this different types of benefits that we're talking about, that it is maslaha jizidiya, you know, it's either a benefit related to their body, meaning related to their desires. So then here, then the command in this hadith is for irshad, you know, it is just showing you what is best, meaning that it is recommended, it's showing you what's best, not an obligation. So this shows us the two different rulings that the scholars, most of the scholars hold the view that it's an obligation. Okay, if, you, if, a, if a man has the ability, uh, then he should marry. Uh, this is the general hukum, the general ruling. And some of the scholars say, no, it depends on the, benef the depending on the man's, uh, his situation. You know, and his, his ability and looking at his, his particular situation. Ben Othaymin then gives what he believes is the most correct opinion per pertaining to this hadith and this issue. He said, first, it is the sunan of the Mursaleen, meaning it's the way of the prophets, alayhim afdal salatu salam. And this is in accordance with the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, ta where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in Surah Al-Ra'ad, verse 38, Allah says, وَلَكَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا رُسُولٍ مِّنْ قَبْلِكَ وَجَعَلْنَا لَهُمْ أَزْوَاجٍ وَذُرِّيَّةٍ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, في كتاب الكريم, We have sent uh, messengers uh, before you, and we gave them spouses and children. So here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, what we learn from this ayah uh, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this verse in the Quran, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the messengers, and from their sunnah was that they married and they had children. And also the statement of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where he said, so the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in an authentic hadith, which we're going to take, it'll be the next hadith, uh, related to uh, the, the people, uh, three uh, individuals who wanted to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were doing great ibadah and one of them said, I'm not going to marry. And the Prophet ﷺ heard about this and he said, I marry women. Whoever desires other than my sunnah, my way, then they're not from me. So here, 
This shows that this was the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and that those who desire other than his sunnah are not from him, meaning doesn't mean that they're not from the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, does not mean ala itlaq that they are not uh, Sunni or they are not Muslim or anything like this, no. But the meaning here is that they are not following that which is best, which is the the way of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They're not following, following that which is mustahab and perhaps they could even fall into something which is muharram or pro, you know that is prohibited or at least disliked so that it is something dangerous that we have to be careful about not following the sunnah of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam so bin Uthaymin used these two texts this verse from the Quran and this uh, hadith from the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to show that in his view that the correct view is that it is an obligation for the one who's able to do so, to do so. Uh, however, however, in this regard, the fuqaha, the scholars of fiqh and jurisprudence, rahimahumullah, they divided nikah into the five, uh, the five ahkam of, in fiqh, meaning wajib, mustahab, Mubah, uh, Makru, Muharram. So they said Nikah, marrying, can fall under one of these five, uh, five rulings. And it just depends upon the situation. So the wajib, first wajib. So those, the, they say, some of the fuqaha, they say the wajib, and Nikah, wajib, huwa alladhi yukun ala men uh, so, nikah, those who say that it, uh, the, in the hal or the condition, the state, when it becomes wajib upon an individual, if they are fearful of committing zina. They're very fearful, that they're pre pretty sure that they're very close to falling into uh, uh, zina, which is a very serious sin, one of the major sins. So, this person, it becomes an obligation upon them to marry, and especially, especially if they have the ability to do so. And this is order, in order to uh, fulfill their desires in a proper way. The second situation is when it is haram. It could actually fall into haram. So the scholars, they mention that, for example, one example of when it could be haram to actually have a child is if uh, the Muslim, uh, they're living in uh, Dar al-Harb. They're living in the abode of war, meaning they're in a country which is hostile towards, towards Islam, and they are fighting and oppressing Muslims, perhaps killing and enslaving Muslims. In this situation, it could be haram, the fuqaha mentioned, because perhaps they will have a child and their child will become a, a slave to uh, a disbeliever. So for this reason, the, the, those scholars of fiqh mention that in this situation, it actually can become haram. The other ahkam, when, it, when does it become makru? Makru meaning disliked. For uh, an example of this issue that the fuqaha mentioned is if a person who's very poor, who does not have a lot of desire to get married, then in this situation, they're not going to benefit uh, from getting married in the sense that this the burden of getting married, it could be difficult upon them because they don't have to fight, they're poor. They don't have financial means. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ar-razaq. But at the time, this person doesn't have the means. And maybe it's difficult for them to find employment. Whatever the situation is, they're from the, they're from the fuqara. So in this situation, if they do not have strong desires, then it can actually be disliked that they marry in this situation. And according to the fuqaha, the... Uh, 
when it becomes mubah or where there is no uh, necessarily a hukum pertaining to it to get get married this is for a person who has desires but does not have the wealth uh, to get married married but he does Uh, so, so in this situation, uh, this uh, individual uh, the, for, for example, the individual who a person who who has wealth but doesn't have desires, this is one example of when it could just be Muba, they just get married. They, they want some companionship. They get married, but it's not because they have a lot of desires to get married. They're not afraid to fall into that which is haram and so forth. And they have wealth. For this person, uh, according to the fuqaha, this could be a situation, a scenario, when it could be mubah. When it could be uh, just permissible for them to marry, but it's not necessarily recommended, nor is it disliked, nor is it an obligation for them. And those are in accordance with those ahkam that we mentioned. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows us also the excellent uh, ta'lim of the Prophet ﷺ, that the Prophet ﷺ was the best of teachers and instructors والسلام, and making things clear for his nation because here we are 1400 years later still looking at these texts in order to derive the hukum and practice our religion. And this is because of the clarity of the, the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and for him giving us even in many of uh, his uh, hadith giving us the illa, giving us the illa, meaning the, the reason behind the ruling. And here the Prophet ﷺ said uh, some, of, some of the reasons that were mentioned in the hadith is that uh, that it is better for lowering the gaze by marrying and that it is uh, and, and better for protecting the private parts. So those are two Illas, or two reasons that the Prophet ﷺ commanded with marriage. So the ruling was the command to marriage, and the illa, the reason was also mentioned in the hadith. Two reasons is that it helps protect the private parts, and it helps to uh, uh, to help lower the gaze. Another benefit of this hadith is it also illustrates for us that it is uh, an obligation for us to lower our gaze, to not look at that which is prohibited, and uh, to avoid the muharramat. And we already mentioned some of the adillah, adillah for that. Also, this hadith shows us that it is mashroor to protect and preserve one's private parts, to avoid uh, that which is muharram. Uh, you know, zina and uh, masturbation, and so on and so forth. This hadith also shows, uh, uh, illustrates for us, or another benefit of this hadith, is this hadith also shows us to stay away from anything which encourages us to uh, not lower our gaze, to get into the Muharramah. And this is where especially in the time of this great fitna that we live in with with the nature of pornography it's not like before uh, even when I was uh, a, a young youth where those kind of things were only through probably pictures and magazines now the internet any young child can gain access to websites especially in many of the countries, especially in the West, but even in many of the other countries that don't filter pornography. And even if they filter it, they're so easy to get around the filters. So the problem is, it's a, it's of epidemic proportions, the 
uh, addiction to pornography, and this is even in the Muslim lands, the addiction to pornography. We're not just saying that it happens, but addiction in many of the places. Wallahu mustaan. Probably in all the places. Wallahu mustaan. So, it shows us from this hadith to uh, ijtinab, to stay away from those things which even lead to lower, not lowering the gaze. And obviously, if someone is looking at muharramat on video, and on television, on their computer, on whatever, their devices, their smartphones, that they are looking at directly at muharramat, they're not lowering their gaze. So they've totally went against that, uh, that ruling. Wallahu musta'an. And another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also, and this will be the last benefit we'll talk about about this hadith, tahrim al-istimna, alladhi yusammunahu al-ada al-sirriya. So this is something uh, that the Arabs mentioned, but the, the Shaykh mentions that is impermissible masturbation. And we, we talked a little bit about this. And with regards to masturbation, it is muharram. It's impermissible. However, as, as some details, uh, so if it is said, Ben Uthameen said, if it is said, what should a man do uh, if he has a lot of desires and he cannot fast, or he, he even if he fasts, even if he fasts, his desires are very strong. So this is those in those exceptional cases that people uh, have difficulty with their uh, controlling themselves. Then Ben Uthameen answers by saying, we say, then uh, in this situation, istimna is a lesser sin, meaning uh, masturbation is a lesser sin than adultery, than committing zina. Meaning that they're both muharram, but this is the lesser of the two evils. And he said, and for this reason, Imam Ahmed rahimahullah ta'ala said that it was uh, you know gave excuse or gave uh, uh, a ruksa a permi per permissibility to masturbate if someone is very fearful of committing zina they're very close to zina and they are unable to fast for whatever reason because this is less of a sin than committing zina. There's another group of ulama, some of the ulama, that even say, because Imam Ahmed is not saying it's permissible, but he's also holding the view that it is in place of committing zina, that it is a, a lesser sin. Okay, it's a ruksa. That perhaps it's, uh, it's unclear if he's saying that it's, it's still sinful, but when he says it's a ruksa, usually that is not something that is sinful meaning that it is uh, permissible to do under this extreme situation that you're very fearful of committing zina and you cannot fast or fasting is absolutely not working for you. So another group of the ulama actually say joaz, say permissible to masturbate if it is an absolute necessity. So they are saying the rora. Uh, and this is for those, uh, you know, in the most extreme situation, and they use as evidence that some of the Sahaba that when they were uh, uh, fighting battles and they didn't have access to, to wives and, and women that they uh, would commit, uh, they would that they would masturbate. And this was in the Dorora, this was an extreme situation because they were fearful of falling into that which was more severe. So some of the ulama for this reason even say that it is uh, permissible. And those are just some of the benefits of this hadith. In the second hadith, in the Kitab and Nikah, when Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu, anna nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, hamidallah wa athna alayhi, wa qala, lakinni ana usalli, وأنام وأصوم وأفطر وأتزوج النساء فمن رغب عن سنتي فليس مني متفق عليه 
in this hadith, which is in Bukhari and Muslim, the hadith narrated by Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala an, he said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam praised Allah, extolled him, and said, yet I pray and sleep I fast and break my fast, and I marry women. He who is displeased with my sunnah is not my follower, agreed upon. In this hadith uh, of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, it shows us the importance of balance in Islam that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam lived a very balanced life and for the believer the life of the Prophet Alaihi Salatu Wasallam is the best of, the exa uh, best of examples and that means that is how we determine whether someone is balanced whether someone is just is by going back to the example of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and in this hadith, which is in Kitab Nikah, is in the Book of Marriage. The reason behind this hadith is that three people from the Sahaba to Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Radiyallahu Ta'ala they came to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and from their very severe love for following the Sunnah and their severe love for Khair which shows us this is the nature, this is how the Sahaba were is they had a love uh, for doing good deeds for us, many of us we do things with laziness. We do whatever we think is sufficient. Oh, I've prayed enough today. I'm not going to get up. I'm not going to do this. So we make excuses for why we shouldn't do more khair. But the Sahaba, radiallahu ta'ala, anhum ajma'in, they were haris al al -ilm. They were very... Uh, they, they, they desired knowledge. And they desired practice. And they wanted knowledge that would bring them closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these uh, Sahaba, radiallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'in, they had this very strong desire to do something good. And they came to the wives of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and they asked them about the deeds that the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, did. Uh, these are deeds they call sirr meaning they were secretive deeds that no one would know except who? Except his wives, radiallahu ta'ala anhunna, because they were with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in places, of course, where others weren't. They lived in the houses of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so they said, so this was their hujjah or their, this was their reasoning for doing what they they did. This gives us the background of this hadith. They said that the and the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qad ghafara Allah lahu ma taqaddam min dhimbihi wa ma ta'akhir. They said the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he's been forgiven for what he did in the past uh, and, and, and whatever sins that might occur in the future. He's been forgiven. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. However, we were not like that. Okay, and this is true. So some of them said, I will fast and I won't break my fast. As another one of those companions, radiallahu ta'ala anhum, said, I will stand in the night prayer and I won't go to sleep. And the third said, I will not marry women. And 
so forth. So they each had determined some act of ibadah that they thought would bring them closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they felt they had more need than the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa to be forgiven and more need in order to have their ibadah accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then they were going to put strenuous, be very strenuous in performing these acts of ibadah. And I want to highlight this is uh, uh, something that's common sometimes for people who either they begin to reestablish their practice in Islam. Maybe they were born Muslim to a Muslim family, but they never really practice or they become uh, religious. So then they sometimes they have such a zeal, you know, such a desire to come closer to Allah and be a good Muslim that sometimes they fall into these mistakes of going beyond the bounds of being extreme and this can happen likewise for those who are not Muslim when they come to Islam many of us we had a zeal when we came to Islam the zeal is not like after you've been Muslim 10, 5, 10, 15, 20 years it's not the same as when when you first got the light of Islam you were so eager to do any and everything that seemed Islamic and to practice everything that you read about to the extent of your ability and what's problematic is a lot of times that's based on a lack of knowledge but having too much zeal so Islam gives us that balance and that balance is contained in the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so then they said this as the Shah explains that they said this out of fr from Ijtihad they said this from Ijtihad meaning they were making judgments they knew prayer was mashroor is, is, is wajib that it was an obligation upon them to pray five times a day and that there would be reward for the night prayer so out of Ijtihad the one who was going to not go to sleep after prayer and just can pray the whole night from their own understanding they thought they would be coming closer to Allah that this would be a way to even be a better mu'min and, to, and that they are more in need of their sins being forgiven as we mentioned likewise from Ijtihad the one who said they would fast and not break their fast because they thought hey if I'm getting that reward for uh, uh, sunrise to sunset fasting what if I extend that then I should be extending my reward okay this was from their Ijtihad they didn't know better but they were doing the best that they could. So we know from the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasallam said that someone, uh, especially if they're Ahlan for this, meaning that they are a person of Ijtihad, they're a person who has knowledge not just for anyone to, to say they understand the text like this and then make Ijtihad, no. But those people who have knowledge, the scholars and so forth, that they when they make their ijtihad, if they are correct, they receive two rewards, as the Prophet ﷺ said. If they are incorrect, <clears throat> then they receive one reward. So they're still rewarded. That's the ni'mah, and that shows the mercy of Islam. So these companions, radiallahu ta'ala majma'in, they had this zeal and desire to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they were exercising their ijtihad. And then the third one also, it was from their ijtihad that they would not marry because uh, this was similar to the way of those who came before, uh, before them from the, especially from the, the Christians that they, you know, had this rahbaniya, this uh, uh, way of abstaining you know like we have nuns and priests they say I'm not going to marry I'm I'm they their argument is they say they're married to God is what they say 
from this concept, even if they mean by it something else. But we would never use those kind of terms as believers. But their intent is that they intend to do good by abstaining totally from the worldly pleasures. They believe they will be less distracted from their worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the concept. And this was a practice of those who came uh, before our nation. However, the Prophet والسلام, and what was the sunnah of the NBA differed to this. It differed to this, meaning that they married, as we mentioned in the first hadith, that they married the 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 NBA, they married. You know, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, Allah mentions this in the Quran, so that this was the sunnah of the NBA to marry and have children. So this was something that influenced this Sahabi radiallahu ta'ala anhum. Some of the great benefits that we gain from this hadith, and there are many. One of the benefits is that Islam Muharabat al-Islam lil rahbaniya that Islam completely uh, negates or rejects this concept of abstaining from marriage abstinence so Islam encourages abstinence when a person is unable to marry, meaning that they shouldn't commit zina, they shouldn't do anything muharram, as we mentioned. But however, al-itlaq, you know, in general to practice this, no. Islam rejects that. For someone to say, I want to just come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not marry, then this is not from the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this in turn can be a rejection of the sunnah as we find from this hadith especially if there are no other lawful ways to fulfill uh, their desires <clears throat> and we also know that when we or one of the illa, one of the reasons behind rejecting this is Islam uh, negates or rejects Islam rejects uh, anything that will weaken your ibadah anything that will weaken your ibadah so for example the person who does not marry they refrain from marriage totally we're not saying for a limited time some people do to their career uh, they want to finish school whatever the case may be, get in better financial situations. People do this. They practice this. This is the reality. Without, whether we look at how mashru it is or not. And we already talked about those various ahkam in the first hadith. However, this can be a distraction in your ibadah. When a person is in great need to marry, meaning that they have a, a rugba, you know, a desire to fulfill uh, to have, uh, you know, companionship and sexual relations in Karamakam Allah, that of course through the marriage bond that this is how we fulfill that. But if they do not fulfill it and they restrain, there are chances they are going to fall into the muharramat. And even if they are very strong and do not fall into the muharramat, which is very rare, most people, the average person, will not be able to abstain without eventually falling into uh, some of those uh, sinful practices. So if uh, they abstain, then perhaps this will distract them from their other ibadah, like their salat, because they'll begin to, uh, their, maybe their mind will wonder, because they don't have any release, which is a natural release and a natural need to fulfill their natural desires. The second benefit of this hadith أن العبادة قد قد تكون مكروهة لا لذاتها ولكن لما يعرض لها من الوصف 
very excellent benefit from uh, Imam bin Uthaymeen, rahimahullah ta'ala. He said that ibadah, you know, worship, sometimes it can actually be makru. It can actually be disliked. La li thatiha. Not in and of itself. However, due to its, it's contradicting the way in which you perform that ibadah. And we're going to explain. So this is a fantastic benefit. And this is why we, uh, we benefit from the scholars of Islam. Because they left, and they con they left such a, tre uh, a treasure of knowledge. And how to understand the core text of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the sunnah of the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's why we strive our best to learn and benefit from the text and the scholars that are living. We benefit from them because they, their, 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 their uh, insight into the text and their study of the text, they spent their lives dedicated towards Islam and uh, supporting Islam with, with knowledge which will stay. It remains in Islam. Knowledge remains in Islam. And this is a, uh, a, like a, a type of continuous charity for them. The Prophet Sallallahu said, uh, That when a person dies, that what they leave behind, they will leave behind, uh, when they die, they will leave behind three things. You know, all their, everything will disappear except three. And one of the things is Sadaqa Jariya. Well, Ilm Yuntafabi. He said, uh, the first thing the Prophet ﷺ said, a Sadaqa Jariya. The continuous charity. So when you build a masjid, you buy some Qurans and leave them in the masjid, whatever the case may be. Something that's continuous or, or building a waqf, as we talked about in Kitab al um, all of these things. And we explained this hadith prior to this. And, and then the second thing, Al Ilm Yuntafabi. Knowledge which the people benefit from. So all of those great imams that left behind knowledge, the compiler of this book, the ruat, the narrators, all of them will receive reward because they kept the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam alive. So getting back to the issue at hand, we said that sometimes ibadah, worship, can be makru, can be actually disliked, not in and of itself, but because of the way it is practiced. So someone can, and it actually could be Muharram. What's the case it could be Muharram? Well, it can be Muharram if uh, someone is doing a bid'ah. Bid'ah is Muharram, it's haram. Kullu bid'ah thin dalala. The Prophet ﷺ said, all bid'ah is misguidance. Kullu bid'ah thin dalala, kullu dalala thin thin nar. And all misguidance leads to the fire. So, that lets us know that bid'ah, meaning doing ibadah, in a way which is not mashru'ah, you know, not in accordance with the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which goes back to this hadith, because he said, مَنْ رَدِبَ أَنْ سُنَّتِي فَلَيْسَ مِنِّي Whoever desires other than my sunnah is not from me. You know, it's not from my community. So, this lets us know that sometimes ibadah, worship itself, an act of worship, can sometimes be disliked or haram if it is not done in accordance with the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu And this is why Ahlul Sunnah is so strict regarding uh, the other sects in Islam that uh, create and do new innovations in worship. They may seek, they may have a good intention, they seek to come closer to Allah. What's wrong if I turn off the lights and I make dhikr for six hours and 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 and, be, uh, or, and twirl around. It makes me feel lightheaded and, and closer and more conscious. Okay, but this is not from the ibadah of the Prophet ﷺ. Even though you may have fit one criterion of a type of dhikr, you were doing a remembrance of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, but it was greater mashru. It was in contradiction to the way the Prophet ﷺ did it. So it became muharram, and it was an act of ibadah, but it was haram. Likewise, something can be makru. Uh, for example, in this situation, 
uh, in, in the example of the hadith is that uh, the the Sahabi radiallahu ta'ala who wanted to pray all night and not sleep well this will affect all of his other ibadah so then this becomes makru at least because it can actually it would affect his wajibat and the rest of his life of earning his livelihood you would be tired you wear yourself out and you wouldn't be able to perform the wajib your obligatory duties so here it would even be that a person is doing ibad and it seems like it's a great thing but you have to take out time for sleep this is the the way of the prophet sallallahu and it's more in accordance with your fitrah the sunnah is more in accordance with your fitrah so that is one of the benefits we gain from that Another benefit of this hadith Mubadaratu Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam li ibtal al batil So uh, another benefit of this hadith is it shows that the Prophet alayhi salatu salam was quick in rejecting uh, you know, commanding the good and forbidding the evil. The Prophet Sallallahu didn't del delay this. Commanding the good and forbidding the evil. So, the Prophet Sallallahu was also very quick in Haris to uh, to show or to negate falsehood. He didn't wait. He negated it uh, immediately. And in this situation, what, how did that happen? The Prophet wasallam, when it was mentioned to him about this, that he stood up and he addressed it immediately and prohibited it imme immediately. So this is from the Sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, and it, it shows uh, that the Prophet wasallam, fulfilled his, obli his obligations as a as a prophet alayhi salatu wasalam doing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's bidding and destroying falsehood and any false practices no matter who did it so that's another benefit we gain from this hadith another benefit we gain from this hadith is and this relates to the to the last uh, benefit we mentioned uh annahu yanbaghi i'lan wal inqar idha da'at al haja Ilavadik, that it is, it becomes, uh, that it is um, sometimes an obligation or a uh, something good and permissible to openly denounce something which is uh, false or wrong if there is a need to do so. Meaning, so if it needs addressing immediately, outwardly in order to teach the greater community then it's better to do so but sometimes of course commanding the good and and uh, commanding the good and forbidding the evil especially with the leaders for example is done behind closed doors it's not done out in front of the people because the the benefit of rejecting that munkar or that negating that falsehood could be over uh, overcome or uh, have uh, there could be a greater harm that is spread with that so you may be doing something which is good but it may spread a greater evil so then the mufasid is greater than the uh, than the maslaha you know that the the harm is greater than the good why because then the hearts of the people may be turned against the leader so for example in this situation, the Prophet وسلم, from his fiqh, his understanding, and his wahi, of course, that he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he dealt with it openly and directly. And here we're studying about it today because the sunnah is recorded. But if it had been something behind closed doors, perhaps we wouldn't have that. 
that sunnah. We wouldn't know the value. So it was made known. The Prophet ﷺ addressed it immediately and spoke about it so they all could learn that this is not a part of my sunnah and this is the proper way to do it. And whoever desires other than my sunnah is not from me. So this is also a, a way of reprimanding and letting uh, the pe educating the people so that they know that my sunnah is, is the is the way uh, is the only way because this is what brings you closer to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So, if there is a need to do so, then and and it's appropriate, then sometimes it may be appropriate to uh, admonish or negate the falsehood openly, and then there are other times when it may be better to uh, to do it quietly or behind closed doors and this comes with fiqh this comes with knowing and understanding the text and the hikmah and the wisdom of the situation so that is usually that is something that Allah has favored the ulama with from study and experience another benefit of this hadith is uh, this hadith is also This hadith uh, clarifies that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, his deen was made easy, and it's something that we can all practice. You know, it wasn't abstract. And what I mean by this, for example, what we learn from a lot of the communities, like for example, Buddhist, uh, some of the Buddhist communities that are tied to the Buddha, for example, that in their shirk and what have you, they do, some of them do some very extreme things which are very difficult for the average person. So for them, these very extreme practices which are actually outside of our nature, they require so much and require negating most of human uh, regular activities. To exclude yourself from societies entirely. All of humanity can't do that. You know, we have societies, we have interactions. So these kind of extremes, they don't exist in Islam. Islam, rather, goes with our nature and our fitrah. And this is the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Making the deen easy. Some of those things which we are, uh, you know, that gave us that balance, as I mentioned. The Prophet Sallallahu said, Usalli wa unam wa usun wa uftr. He said, uh, I, fa I, I pray, I sleep. Uh, I pray and I sleep, I fast and I break my fast. Okay? This is how he dealt with that. His prophetic sunnah is something which is easy. You know, and, it, and it, it's easy with our fitra. Yes, you have some, uh, str the struggle of fasting, you know, in a, a long winters or hot summers or, you know, whatever your situation is. Those are the trials and the tests. There's always has to be some sacrifice. But Islam gives you that balance, that you 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 pray, and then you you sleep as well. You have time to rest your body. You have time to enjoy your family. You have time for other things. Likewise, you fast, but then you break your fast, and then you enjoy the greatness in the farah, the happiness of breaking your fast. And the reward in Jannah will be even greater. May Allah grant us all Jannah. I mean, another benefit of this hadith is that it is not permissible. We learn from this hadith that it's not permissible for us to cause great difficulty upon ourselves with regards to ibadah. And as I mentioned, especially the zeal of some people who newly begin to practice, they'll do all kind of, uh, all kind of uh, activities, uh, you know, and, and, and go beyond the, the bounds a lot of times and through zeal. But Islam again gives us that balance because you want to do something that you can be consistent in your practice you want to do something that's not going to make you make you hate ibadah or m make you make you so you don't turn away from the ibadah or reject it so you want something you need a balance you need to not put so much great difficulty as as a, one of them who stood in prayer uh, and and I believe it relates to this same hadith that in order to stay awake they tied themselves uh, uh, you know, 
so that they would not fall asleep, you know, to continue doing their ibadah, you know, to make sure there's some strain on their body, maybe a little pain to keep their ibadah. No, Islam doesn't call us to do this. Islam is balanced. Take a rest if you need the rest, you know, and this will bring you closer to Allah than being uh, severe on your body and doing those things which you're unable to uh, continue with. Another benefit of this hadith, it shows us that in general, fasting, uh, you know, in the various, uh, you know, the Prophet ﷺ said, wa 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 he, he, he said, I fast and I break my fast. And from this statement, it shows that fasting in general, uh, on the various times that the Prophet ﷺ fasted, it wasn't restricted to just Ramadan. That this is in general. For example, this includes uh, general fasting and fasting, uh, you know, on uh, on on uh, Mondays and Thursdays, on the three days during the month, uh, Ayam al Bayd, and the six days of Shawwal, uh, Yom Arafah, Yom Ashura, and and other times which are mishroor, that Islam. Uh, you know that this is these are the ways in which you can follow the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so it shows us in general that because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said I fast and I break my fast that there are various times that lets us know that there's uh, many opportunities to fast and of course break your fast and follow the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam without being excessive without being say I'm gonna fast Monday through uh, through Thursday but instead, no, fast as the Prophet ﷺ fasted, and you'll receive more reward without being strenuous uh, excessively on your body. Another benefit uh, of this hadith is this hadith also shows, and this is the shahid or the purpose of this hadith being in this chapter, is that it shows that uh, the mashru'iyya, mashru'iyya al nikah, that is that uh, marriage is legislated in nikah in, in Islam. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, What to Zawaj Nisa, that I marry women, that this is from the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it is from his prophetic guidance, and that we should not leave this Sunnah. So that is one of the main reasons why why this hadith, or is the main reason this hadith is in this chapter. Okay, that's the Shahid. Another uh, benefit that we'll mention uh, with regards to this hadith is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Men ragiba an sunnati an sunnati falaysa minni So that whoever desires other than my sunnah is not from me So this lets us know that when we do un-Islamic when we do even ibadah in a way the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did uh, didn't do it then this can be uh, this can be a, a way of showing that we desire other than the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, or that we feel that what we have is better. So at times it just depends on the person's intention and their you know how they think about what they're doing. Sometimes it could be muharram. Sometimes it could be uh, makru. Sometimes it could be even kufr if they think that what they have is better. I know the Prophet ﷺ fasted like this, but my way is like this. So it's very important to make sure, and this shows us the importance of the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ following his sunnah. Those are just some of the many benefits that we gain from this hadith.